Today we want to discuss meetings. Can you tell us what happens during a research meeting? Um, I guess for me a research meeting is a meeting where the faculty member of who's leading the group is with um, the group of PhD students and they're around the table and uh, either discussing papers or presenting um, work done within the group or outside uh, or maybe practicing a uh, presentation that a student has to go give uh, at another venue. What were the meetings like when you were a PhD student? So I did my own PhD at uh, Cornell University in the Department of Electrical Engineering there. And uh, my advisor was uh, Dr. Stephen Wicker, uh, and his interest was broadly in wireless networks. <clears throat> and. Uh, I think it wasn't just our group. Many groups at Cornell were very tightly knit uh, in the sense that um, the students and the faculty would meet on a regular basis. And um, for me personally, I, I remember, you know, the very first semester I went to Cornell and uh, there were these uh, group meetings within my, my group. It was um, an opportunity really to find out what other students in the group were doing. And most of the group meetings at the time were largely that, which was uh, individual PhD students talking about what they have uh, been working on and um, but I was also sometimes uh, talking to my other uh, friends um, who were in other groups um, PhD students in other groups and they would tell me about how the structure of their meetings were and it was a little different from group to group uh, and there were you know for example other research groups um, which met again weekly for um, you know long periods of time uh, three, four hours in some cases to read research papers. So although that wasn't something that um, we did in my own research group, it was something that I, I um, definitely observed while I was at Cornell. What are the group meetings like uh, now that you conduct uh, for your work? So I have uh, my own um, group, the Autonomous Networks Research Group at USP, and this is typically about 10 to 12 uh, PhD students, some master's students perhaps, and occasionally even an undergrad student in the mix. Um, and we typically meet on a weekly basis during the semesters. Um, there is like one day a week in the evening typically, uh, so you know, typically starting around 5 o'clock or so. And um, about two hours, occasionally maybe even three hours. And uh, during those meetings, we do, uh, you know, many of the activities that I mentioned, uh, reading a research paper together, presenting uh, someone else's work. This would be an individual student giving a presentation, um, or it could be presenting their own work, either because they're practicing for their own PhD qualifying exam or uh, defense, or if they're going out to give a talk at a conference. Um, that's largely what we do in group meetings. Occasionally, we might even use a group meeting to brainstorm on some new uh, research directions. Or um, I've, I'm trying to remember. I mean, there are occasionally times when I just talk to my group about different um, aspects of the PhD student life, about um, research and motivation, um, sort of very general topics to do with the PhD experience. So all the content sounds very useful to the students, but if I heard correctly, you said some of these meetings are three hours long. Were you serious about that, or you were just kidding? No, I'm quite serious about that. I think we even had one of these just uh, a week ago in my group. Um, what usually happens is that these long meetings correspond to reading of papers. And uh, I make a distinction between, so maybe I should take even a step back. My group does research that's both theoretical and uh, more systems oriented as well. And when we read in particular papers that have a very heavy mathematical content, when it's really a lot of theorems and proofs and derivations, um, we find it really helpful to be reading that paper together rather than you know, one or two students reading them off on their own and then coming to give like a lecture about it. And the reason for this is that you just tend to get much deeper into the material when it's everyone uh, at the same, on the same page going together. And in fact, I don't particularly encourage or require my students to have read the paper before we even show up. So it's really a process of, here's a new paper, you know, it's, it's got some complicated math in it, I've never read it before, 
but I'm in the same boat as everybody else around me. Let's just walk through it together. And what this really does is for the students that are newer to sort of observe from the more senior PhD students how they're processing the information. And then we keep, um, we basically take turns. We go around the room and uh, each student takes a turn uh, reading, you know, a few paragraphs. Um, and then when we get to certain uh, descriptions of the math, maybe it's the, the model, the problem formulation or a particular theorem, we keep taking these breaks and we try to make sure we understood everything that it said uh, in that relevant section. And, and the reason it's really taking so long is this constant stopping and clarifying. And what we find is that uh, because it's this very um, communal activity, it's all of us around the table. I haven't even, in most cases, read the paper myself before. Very few of us have. We're really trying to figure this out together. And it's this process of learning together um, uh, that's happening during, the, during those meetings. And so you're trying to parse out, uh, you know, what's the meaning of this? And um, sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes I get stuck. I don't really know what the author might have meant by jumping from this step to this step, what's missing. And then we sit and we puzzle about it. Why is this, you know, author saying that this is true? And uh, what really helps is the fact that if there are 10 or, you know, 12 of us around the table thinking about the same thing, uh, two or three of us will have different ideas. And then we bring them up and then we debate which of those makes sense. And then we get to the point where we really have consensus uh, to some extent about what that means. And then we can move on. And so this process of reading that paper, uh, you know, it's really slow and systematic. But by the end of it, uh, hopefully we've, we've understood very well what we have read. And believe it or not, in those three hours, in most cases, we haven't still finished the paper. So uh, like last week, I think we were reading this paper and it took us between two and a half to three hours. At the end of it, we'd really uh, only done about two thirds of the paper. And we still had a third of the paper left. And we you know, decided maybe it was uh, time to call it. Uh, an evening, and then we continue the next week, um, which is actually just yesterday. So, uh, so the really why it's taking so long is because it's this very um, engaged, participatory learning process for all of us. And and I have to say, I have always found the discussions that happen in that meeting really um, educational myself. And there's a lot of things over the years that I've learned from um, from my students when we were having these discussions and, and sort of thinking through why, um, you know, certain steps happen. And often it's because we're in unfamiliar territory together. It's, it's some new mathematical technique that I'm not familiar with, that no one in the room is particularly familiar with, is often the kind of paper that we pick. So does this work only if uh, most of the students are working in one particular area so that the paper that uh, you're taking three hours to read and understand is not too out of the way for some of the students, then you might get some pushback from the students if the papers that are being selected is almost always outside their research area. Have you experienced anything like that? I think that's a reasonable that's a reasonable question. I, I guess it's sort of unclear what inside and outside an area means, right? You can define that very narrowly or you can define that a little bit broadly. I've always encouraged my students to define their area of interest uh, a little more broadly than the particular topic that they're pursuing for their PhD and for their uh, dissertation, just because you need that breadth when you talk to anybody outside your um, um, thesis committee, right? So the, the day you graduate and you're, or even when you're at a conference and you're talking to people, you're going to be talking to people with slightly different um, interests and research. So then having some breadth doesn't hurt. Um, having said that, I think everybody in my group is uh, broadly familiar with the same set of um, problems because we are all working on wireless networks, maybe at different layers, maybe on different types of wireless networks. Um, much of the mathematics is uh, accessible to most of the students in my group. Um, I do require all the students in my group to take a course in uh, real analysis. Uh, they all take courses in probability. And um, all of them I, I asked to take a course in analysis of algorithms. So there's a little bit of a common baseline in terms of their mathematical uh, maturity, although there's still some differences because of the year of the PhD student, perhaps. But, um, but I think there's enough of a common background uh, and enough of commonality in our interests that, that it works out. Uh, but I can imagine that if it's a topic that's completely out of, um, you know, one student's area that he or she might find it a little bit more tedious than the others. Uh, I haven't had a lot of pushback from students on that. I mean, 
And in my group, I mentioned, you know, there are students that do very theoretical work. There's actually students that don't do theoretical work. And for those students, um, it can be potentially more challenging because they're not doing theoretical work to be going through these theory papers. But I found over the years, they still appreciated it because even if this wasn't going to be their strength, it wasn't going to be the thing that they were doing for their PhD thesis, uh, it added a certain additional dimension of breadth and appreciation to their, uh, you know, their PhD experience. Question that I wanted to ask you uh, is uh, if you had any thoughts as to why these longer uh, meetings are not so common. For I think there's a few reasons for it. Um, I, I would say, first of all, not every paper is amenable to being read and discussed over a long meeting. And in particular, I find uh, even within my group, uh, because of our interest in both theory and systems papers, that uh, we generally don't have as much to discuss in a systems paper as we do in a theory paper. Um, and, and it's largely because they are more comprehensible when you read them, right? It's really mostly plain English. Uh, there's a little bit of subtlety involved maybe in the design. Um, sometimes if there's some algorithmic component, there's something to it. But in, to some extent, you understand it uh, sufficiently well enough for you to take away the, the key points because the, the, the bulk of the hard work that goes into the systems paper happens behind the scenes. It's in the code that the person wrote. It's in the hours and hours the person might have spent in coming up with you know, good, repeatable experiments. Um, and and you know, much of that shows in the paper, but a lot of it also happens sort of behind the scenes and is not explicitly in the paper per se. So just reading that paper very carefully could reveal all the work that went in, but doesn't actually, um, you don't have to surmount a big obstacle to understand what, what the sort of, uh, what's in the paper itself. Whereas in theory papers, all that hard work that they put in is in the paper itself, because it's in the form of the proof of the theorem that they have uh, just, you know, whatever derivations they have, whatever proofs they have, whatever theorems they have. Um, and, and, and as, Everybody knows they're also harder to read, right, because they're so densely packed with mathematical notation. Um, so I think they, they need a lot more unpacking. They need a lot more care um, to read. And I think I found personally that individual students, if I ask them to go read a paper, um, they will read it, but often with this, uh, often generally to get enough of an idea about what the paper is about, but not understand it in every little detail. And for that, you need very careful, very meticulous reading. And, and the more you get trained in doing it, for example, by these group meetings, the easier it is to even go off and do that on your own. Um, I think it's not very popular because it's so cumbersome. I mean, you know, two, three hours a week, um, I think for most faculty members is a lot to spare from what seems like a busy schedule. Uh, I mean, it is a busy schedule with, with all the things that you're doing. So that may be one reason it's not popular. The other reason, like I said, is that, you know, depending on your area, if it's a very... Uh, practical experimental systems type of area, uh, I, I'm not sure that you necessarily benefit from having long uh, paper discussion meetings. The other might just be culture. I mean, why did I adopt this particular style of group meeting? It's because I saw another group doing it, and I tried it out, and I loved it. And I found that the students really um, responded positively to that. Um, and I personally also see that those sessions, especially where we're you know taking these long um, longer discussions over uh, technical points to learn something new. For me, it's the only chance I have uh, at my stage of the career to be taking a class. So in some sense, I'm, I'm um, a student when I'm in that room trying to understand what's, what's in that paper. Uh, and I have always found it easier to understand when I'm reading something with someone else than um, completely on my own. I think different people have different personalities when it comes to that too. Uh, but I always found it easier to understand uh, particularly more challenging things if I'm discussing it with others. And, I, I, you know, over the years I found my students uh, have found that helpful and, and useful too. A different format many faculties have tried is student-led reading groups. Did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have... Uh, and even now we do occasionally have sessions where there is one student who's presenting an idea... I find that it only works if it's a short session. So if it's like a half hour, 40 minutes, beyond that, it's sort of, it's a lecture. You're, you know, sitting there and you're listening to somebody else talk. Um, you get distracted, you lose interest. I think it's the same uh, principle that applies uh, to classrooms, that when you have a classroom in which active learning is happening, that 
the students are actually engaged in doing something while class is in session, uh, they're often much more engaged and get a lot out of it compared to a class where they're just sitting back and listening to a lecture, especially if it's a very long lecture. Um, so I, I think that's that's the, the trade-off there, is that if, it, if you really have a student-led uh, type of a discussion, it works for um, shorter sessions, but it's hard to sustain that for a very long period of time because everybody else is mostly just listening to it and you're in this more passive mode. Whereas, in, in fact, I, I really do prefer for everybody to show up at the table not having read the paper before. So we're really on exactly the same page and we all have to work hard to, you know, extract meaning from the raw text that's out there. Somehow it's just, a, it's almost like a fun activity to do together. It's like playing a, a, a game together where we have to understand what's in this, what's in this paper. A short question related to these long group meetings. Do you buy students lunch or dinner during these meetings? I do, absolutely. I mean, yeah, if it's going to be that long, I, I better get, I better feed them. Uh, we, if it's uh, most semesters in the evening, so we do, uh, you know, pizza or, or some kind of takeout dinner. And if it is during lunch hours, as it has been on some semesters due to scheduling issues, um, then lunch. Yeah, I, I try to make sure that these meetings overlap with, with some food. So that sounds great. So my understanding is one of the reasons these group meetings work is also the active involvement of the faculty who is willing to be there for two or three hours in the evening and really try to understand all the details of the topic or the paper that is being discussed. Hopefully we can use some of this experience to have better group meetings in our respective places. Thank you for your time today. Thanks.